what's going on, man? Life is good. That's what's going on. We have a very, very special guest today, the one and only Zach Hample. Great to be here. This is one that I've been excited for. We've been talking about this for, for a hot minute since we uh, exchanged messages. We were just talking about it over Instagram DM. Um, Technology bringing us together. I think I saw the, the doc the MLB did on you a few years back or, or when that came out. And I was like, this guy, <laughs> there's something special, you know, in, in multiple different facets, whether it's the actual energy and effort that's put into the strategy behind what you do, or it's the, the day in and day out effort that you put in all across the country, across the world, and then to have the smarts to actually put some of that online is why I like what you do. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been a pretty crazy road to get to this point. And I still don't really know what the end game is, like where this is all going. But yeah. it's fun and I'm making money from it and doing a lot of other things that kind of branch off from there. So it's working for the moment, you know? So how did it begin? Do you remember what your first baseball was? Or as a kid, did you see yourself being the baseball catching Hell guy? No. What, what did you think you wanted to do with your life? I thought that I, I, I didn't just think, I knew that I was going to be a major league baseball player and end up in the hall of fame. Wow. I mean, there was no question in my mind. Everybody's like, oh, you need something to fall back on. And I was just like, no, like this is it. So I feel like in a way, um, an answer to my own question or people's questions, like you just look at any major leaguer and it's like, well, you know, what would Mike Trout be doing with himself if he weren't a major league baseball player? Well, it's like, here, here we go. Yeah. I mean, nothing else <laughs> or everything else. I, kind of. I, I feel the same exact way for myself. I thought I was going to be an NBA player. And then I woke up, you know, sophomore year of high school and I'm five foot, 10 and a half, you know, not playing worldwide, not dunking. And I'm like, okay, let me, let me, let me change the strategy. So I started broadcasting. <laughs> now um, I will say, I will say, cause I, I'm just going to brag here for a moment. Yes. Um, I'm also five, 10 and a half, five, 11. And I dunked once in my life. It, it was a self alley-oop <laughs> in an open gym from the three point line. From the three. Well, point I mean, I, I threw it from the three point line. Okay. It bounced and I ran up and it hung right above the rim and I jumped oh, and tapped man. it down. And I had two friends there and they kind of rolled their eyes and I'm like, you guys saw that that's a dunk. And they were just like, Ah, uh, yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> sure. So that was a, a weak dunk, but I did dunk once in my so life. So at what anyway. point did you realize you could become the baseball catching guy? Not for a while. Cause when I was very little and I started watching baseball on TV, that's when I first got this itch to try to catch a baseball, not a zillion of them, but just one. Cause I saw other fans doing it. It looked like so much fun. And I went to my first game when I was six didn't get my first ball till I was 12. <laughs> That's a big gap. Yeah. So and now I was only going to one or two or three games a year, okay. which for my parents probably felt like a lot because yeah. nobody in my family cares about sports. Mm -hmm. But for me, it felt like an eternity. And even when I was 12, the first ball I got was a toss up during batting practice. So not really sports center it's top 10 worthy. On the spectrum of value of baseballs to a fan, that's at the, the very low end. But for me, that was a life-changing moment. And I just wanted to get more and more and go to games all the time. Now, I grew up in New York City and I started taking the subway to school by myself when I was 12. And it took two years after that to convince my parents to let me take the subway to games by myself on school nights as long as I woke up the next day and I got my work done so when I was 14, I started going to a ton of games, catching a whole lot of baseballs. Back then, I probably only averaged about one or two a game, which probably seems like a ton for most people. Mm. But I've been averaging almost seven baseballs a game for the last 25 <laughs> years at this point, including <laughs> batting practice and yeah. warmups. But, you know, there were no other blogs. I mean, the internet didn't even really exist when I started doing this. So there were no books written about it there was no one else that I could learn from. So I just kind of made it up as I went along and it took a while to figure things out, but eventually I did. And I'm assuming when you're referring to going to games, that's at the old Yankee stadium in the Bronx. Oh yeah. And Shea. And Shea. Wow. Oh yeah. Did you have any favorite players growing up? Well, I was a Mets fan growing up. Now at this point, I don't have a favorite team. That's why I wear this baseball cap right here with the MLB logo on it. Yep. But you know, I loved all the guys from the Mets, Keith Hernandez and Mookie Wilson and Lenny Dykstra, Wally Backman, Gary Carter, Doc Gooden, 
you know, I like all those guys were just my heroes. And I liked some of the Yankees too. Dave Winfield, Ricky Henderson, Don Mattingly. Legends. So I, I didn't just root against the Yankees because they were <laughs> right. the Yankees. You know, they had a lot of likable guys as well. That's awesome. So where was the point on the the time span and the grand timeline of Zach Campbell's baseball catching where you decided, let me let me go after the seven baseballs a game instead of the one to two? I think it just developed over time. I do remember that the Mets had a historically bad season in 1993. They lost 103 games that year and they needed to do everything to try to win back the fans the next year. So they started opening the stadium a full hour earlier in 1994. So you got a lot of bat- a lot of batting practice. There were a lot more opportunities to catch baseballs. And then of course the strike happened mm. in Major League Baseball. And after that, I think teams as a whole realized that they needed to be more fan friendly. So it was easier to get toss-ups from the players and that's when the numbers really started to increase, when ballparks were opening early and, and the players were being friendly. So it just kind of went from there. And I developed a lot of tricks along the way. So what for, for a youngster out there now that just wants one baseball, not necessarily 10,000, but what is the best strategy for them apart from just showing up early? That's a huge one. Get there for batting practice, bring a glove. And there's a whole bunch of strategies for getting toss-ups from the players. There's a whole bunch of strategies for getting baseballs hit to you in the stands where you're dealing with positioning and thinking of the righties and lefties, who has power, which way the wind is blowing, how strict security is, the crowd size, you know, even how warm or cold it is can affect how far the ball carries. Now, of course, it seems like baseballs are actually stitched a little tighter because the red thread for the stitches is a little bit thicker, it's been proven. Hmm. So the balls are a little rounder and more aerodynamic. So they're traveling farther, which is why there are more home runs. That's interesting. So you got, I mean, in a weird way, you have to know all of these things and a lot of thought and planning goes into it. You know, if a guy is a an off-speed pitcher and he has a lot of downward movement on his pitches, you, know, you can look at his stats. And if, if you see that maybe he's only given up one home run every four or five starts, Maybe it's not the best idea to sit in the outfield. Maybe you want to change your strategy and not go for a home run or vice versa. Or maybe you just sit there anyway and you're like, he'll have a bad game and give up three tonight. (laughs) So I think about all these things and then for getting baseballs thrown by players. One of my tricks that I developed way back in the day was to start wearing the gear of visiting teams. Smart. Because they love to spot their quote unquote fans on the road. (laughs) Savage. (laughs) I mean, I even, I had a player actually basically instruct me to do that back in 1992. David Justice, the Braves right fielder in BP. I wore my Mets jacket. was the first fan in the stadium. Asked him for a ball. There was nobody else around me. And he turned to throw it and then stopped mid-motion and said, I'm not going to throw you a ball if you're wearing a Mets jacket. And 14-year-old me was like, man, I am dumb. Of course he wouldn't throw me a ball when I'm cheering against his team. So the next day I took off the jacket. Same situation. I thought he might remember me, but he didn't. He threw me the ball. And then I just took it a step further and started wearing hats of all the teams. You know, you could buy crappy mesh hats back in the 90s for like six bucks a piece. Yeah. Not a huge investment, but man, the baseballs just started (laughs) pouring in after that. That's amazing. So when you go to games now, are you memorizing everything or are you writing it down and then bringing like pregame, you know, notes to remember when each guy's at the plate, both in batting practice and in the actual game? And then are you running around the arena in the middle of a game? I don't bring notes or research like that. There have been some websites in the past that I've looked at, um, that I've looked at, but at this point it's really instinct. And I guess right a lot of the time, sometimes I really mess up and I'm in one spot and then the guy hits it somewhere else and it just kind of eats at me for a while. And I'm like, dummy, like, why are you sitting here when, you know, he's, He's this tall and he weighs this much and he hits this many home runs. Like you should have known that he was going to hit it over everybody's head. You should have been playing deeper rather than hoping that he'd get jammed or like get under it. Like, so, I mean, that's kind of what makes it fun is that you don't really know, but having been to more than 1600 major league games in my life (laughs) and playing baseball my whole life from the time I could stand on two feet, I was swinging a bat and all the little league and summer leagues and high school ball and summer ball. I played in college a little bit. So I have a pretty good instinct for where the balls are going to go and just 
kind of what guys are trying to do in general. Not everybody's just trying to hit a home run every time. Right. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. So They're a Jeter. <laughs> there you go. So do you do do you actually do research before each and every game or is it more so getting a knack of the players because you're going to so many games over such a long period of time and seeing all these guys in batting practice in baseball, unlike any other sport or most other sports, there are a series of games. So the same two teams play against each other in the regular season a bunch of times where in basketball, you might only see a team twice a year on each coast. Uh, and in football, you might not even see a team. So are you going out and researching beforehand online and stuff of that nature and then not bringing notes or anything? Or is it really all just up there and insight? It's really just all in my brain at this point. If I do research, it might be to look at the active career leaders in home runs and okay. just go down the list and see who's close to a milestone. Wow. Who's maybe has 99 career home runs. And if I'm going to go see those teams, I'll keep that in the back of my head and you know, if I'm sitting out in left field, but there's that one lefty who's sitting on a potential milestone and security allows me to move around, you know, some stadiums are very strict. They check tickets everywhere, but in some cases I'll buy tickets in multiple spots or I might buy oh, a gee. seat. <laughs> yeah. I might buy a seat in left field knowing that there's standing room in right field where anybody can go. Yeah. So when that one lefty comes up, who's at 99 career home runs or 399 or 699, whatever it is, I just know to make a better effort to catch that baseball. So I'll think about stuff like that. I'm always aware when I sit down for a game, I look at the starting lineups. And if there's a name in there that I don't know too well, I will look him up just to see specifically whether or not he's ever hit a home run in the major leagues because catching a guy's first is a big deal. So that's the kind of research that I do. So speaking of big milestones, do you have a favorite caught milestone? Yeah, I would go with the last home run that the Mets ever hit at Shea Stadium. Whoa. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't the very last home run because the Marlins were playing and they had to mess things up and hit two home runs after the one that I caught. Wes Helms and Dan Ugla, I think. I don't remember that, so. Yeah, well, I wish I didn't remember, but, you know, for a moment, I was holding this baseball that was maybe a six-figure ball and then those stupid Marlins hit home runs and now it's uh. probably only a five-figure ball <laughs> but I have no interest in selling it. I got offers and yeah. you know, I still have that in my possession and I love it. That's the most excited I've ever been catching a baseball. And of course there was the A-Rod 3000th hit, but I was more shocked and stunned with that one rather than just the pure joy and excitement that I felt with that final Mets home run at Shea. Got it. So how do you feel about selling baseballs? And also as a parlay on that, what do you do with your baseballs? So what I do with them is at this point, I give most of them away. Actually, I hand out a lot of baseballs to kids at games pretty much right after I catch them. I try to find basically the smallest kid with a glove who has not gotten a baseball or any anytime I catch one and there happens to be someone right nearby, even if they're not a kid, I'm, mm -hmm. I very well might still hand that baseball over. I also send baseballs directly to a children's charity called Pitching for Baseball and Softball. We'll link that below. Cool. And uh, they provide equipment to underserved children in communities all over the world. So I feel like that's a really good cause. And I keep a bunch of baseballs also. I especially keep the commemorative baseballs with the special logos on them. Game home run balls I like to keep. Unless I catch one that's really special that the player wants for himself, then I've always given those back. There have been six of those that I've gotten that the players wanted back. So that's what I do with them. And as far as selling baseballs, I've never sold one. And I don't blame people who do. And I feel like when you catch a historic or valuable baseball, no matter what you do, you're a jerk or a chump. Like you almost can't win because if you keep it and sell it, then you're greedy and the player deserves it. And how dare you? And you right. think you're bigger than the game. Right. And if you give it back to him to be nice, then people are like, you're an idiot. He's a multimillionaire. You got to look out for yourself. You got to take that money and run. So you're going to get it from both sides. And I'm in a position in life where thankfully I'm not scraping by financially. I'm in a good spot. So I don't personally need to sell baseballs, but there are a lot of people out there who are not in that spot and they are struggling or they just want to earn some extra money. And that's America for you. It's, it's a free market and you can do whatever you want. You buy a ticket, you are allowed to keep the ball and do what you want with it. And I, I feel like people who do sell baseballs, whether out of necessity or just because they 
want some extra money, they don't deserve the hate. They really don't. If the players want it enough, they can bid on those baseballs. They have a gazillion dollars. <laughs> Baseball contracts are very kind to their players. Yes, and they are. Fully guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you were the MLB, is there any specific design you would want them to do for a baseball that they haven't necessarily done? That is a cool question. I would want them to make a commemorative logo based on me. I think it's time for a Zach <laughs> Hample logo. Are you listening, Rob Manfred? <laughs> when are we going to see that? Um, I don't know. I've noticed that the logos in recent years have gotten smaller and smaller and they use less ink because a bigger logo makes it easier for the batters to pick up the spin on the baseballs and they can recognize pitches better, which gives them an advantage over the hitters. But then again, MLB experimented for a few years with Mother's Day balls with pink stitching and pink stamping. And one year in 2017, I believe for Father's Day, they had light blue stitching and light blue stamping. And there were some other designs as well. And the batters evidently complained that they could not see those baseballs spinning because of the sky because of i guess the different color of ink and stitches so mlb discontinued those which is a bummer i would love to see i think in hockey doesn't every team have its own logo on the puck or at least they did at some point something i don't know anything about hockey i admit that but yeah you know it would be cool if every team had its own baseball and there were lots of different colors and stuff all-star game baseballs have multicolored stitches for whatever the home team I mean, whatever city it's in, yeah. that team's uniform colors are used for the stitches. That's pretty cool. It is, yeah, it's it's beautiful. So I'd love to see more of that, but I guess you don't really want the baseballs to look gimmicky. I'm just glad that there are no advertisements on the ball. Oh my I don't God. I don't need to be catching Amazon baseballs or <laughs> Coca-Cola baseballs. Now I've just ruined those sponsors yeah. for your show. <laughs> it's okay. But you know, I, I mean it's it's nice that it's just a very clean logo. The the classic MLB silhouette logo is a thing of beauty, I think. And it's nice to see that on the baseballs. I agree. And I can only imagine with the blue stitching, if you're an outfielder and there is blue stitching as you're looking up at the blue sky, that might get a little complicated. Potentially. <laughs> yeah, I think it's harder for the batters than anything, but yeah, that's true. Now, is there one baseball that you've never caught that you would love to? I'll always feel bad that I never caught a Babe Ruth home run. Well, <laughs> But yeah, there have been lots of... <laughs> Hopefully Lots of, we'll be able to time travel one day. Yeah, I would love that. Um, you know, I was just a few feet away from Ken Griffey Jr.'s 600th career home run in Miami. I flew down there just for the purpose of catching that. And then to come so close and not get it was pretty heartbreaking. And there have been plenty of others that I've misjudged, took a bad route through the seats, maybe even said, you know, ah, I'm going to skip this game because I'm so busy. And then they end up hitting one right to the spot where I would have been. I've never gotten a milestone home run where it was important because it was a large number of home runs. Like I've gotten five different players first career home runs and I got A-Rod's 3000th hit, but it would be cool to catch like a 500th career home run or something like that. Catching an all-star game home run, a world series home run, those are on my list for someday. Mm. So, you know, I feel like everything has to go right to catch a home run. Or even to pick one up in the seats if it lands somewhere, you know, if it, it, you have to get the right ricochet, you have to get the right people in the stands who weren't sitting right there where it landed. But if any little thing goes wrong, you won't get that baseball. So, so many close calls every year. I probably have 20 close calls a year and, you know, a good season, I'll average about one homer per month. So maybe six in a year, I'd feel pretty good about. Right now, we're a quarter of the way into the season. I've gotten two home runs this year. So, you know, on pace for a decent season. But of course, I'm so pissed off about the half dozen baseballs that I could have, should have, would have already had. Speaking of baseballs, it's fitting that you brought some baseballs. So what, what are the baseballs that you brought for the people listening on audio and people watching on YouTube can see? But yeah, so these are the two home run balls that I've gotten during games this year. And I can tell them apart because of how they're marked up and scuffed a little bit. So this one was March 31st, Bryce Harper, game home run, his second homer as a member of the Phillies at Citizens Bank Park. It was freezing and so crowded. And I had absolutely no business getting this baseball. <laughs> I wasn't there to catch it. I was there to just kind of hang out and do a video. And I wasn't even in my seat for half the game because I was wandering and eating 
mm. food for the video. And I went out there late in the game and, you know, it, it, it bounced off someone's hands who bobbled it right to me. It was super lucky. So Bryce Harper right there, even though he's struggling this season, I still think he's a future hall of famer and one of the great talents in the game. Sure. So that's cool. And then this other one is nothing that would sell for a lot of money if, if it were to be put up for sale, which it won't. But this is an Eddie Rosario home run from Toronto a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And I was sitting out in left center field and he was batting left-handed. So I wasn't really expecting anything from him, but he launched one pretty much straight away to center field. And in Toronto, they have this tarp that covers the seats in dead center, mm. which serves as a, a backdrop, the batter's eye. It's a black tarp mm. and it's slanted. And so the ball landed on that. And I ran across two se two sections to get there and it started trickling down that tarp and it rolled onto a metal platform where the TV cameras were on those big tripods. And another fan was reaching out for it and I was reaching out for it. Neither of us could reach it because there were bars and poles. And, you know, I just kind of, according to my videographer who was there and had a good view from the side, he called it a Superman dive. <laughs> and I just kind of launched myself from the seats onto this platform, got a little banged up. I always make sure to be very careful about other people. I've never right. injured anybody else. There's a lot of false accusations about how I knock people down and steal balls from kids, but totally not true. That's just Crazy. haters being haters on Twitter. But if anybody gets banged up, it's going to be me. And, you know, I still have a couple of bruises a week and a half later after that, but gotcha. I got the baseball, you know, no foul, no harm. And, you know, I'm still waiting to actually catch one directly on the fly this year. And gotcha. I've been to like 25 games. So I would still argue that I've had bad home run luck this year. <laughs> That's amazing though. Do you have a favorite MLB stadium? And if you had to list a little top three, what stadiums would fall on that list? So I judge stadiums differently from most people. Okay. I judge them based on how many baseballs I can catch and how fun it is to roam and how chill security is and if they're going to yell at me for breathing the wrong way or not. <laughs> so Camden Yards in Baltimore has been my favorite for a long, long time. I also love Cincinnati, Great American Ballpark, and Globe Life Park in Arlington, Texas. Those are probably the top three for me. And I could probably just go to like 30 games at each place and call it a year. And I'd catch so many home runs and have a great time. But the videos might feel a little bit stale because I like to go to as many different stadiums as possible and throw some variety in there. But yeah, just for me having fun, those three are the spots. So what made you want to start making videos on YouTube? You know, it was, all right, well, I'll back this up a little bit. I, I feel like I've always been somewhat of a performer and I like to share things creatively um, and share my journey and teach people and entertain people. And I never really knew what form that would take. And I started writing a journal when I was 17. My dad was a writer. He kind of coached me through my first book that I wrote when I was 19. It came out when I was 21, How to Snag Major League Baseballs. And that was the first time that I kind of became noticed at all as this weirdo that does this cool or maybe totally insane baseball stuff. So that was really the beginning of it. And I wrote a couple other books over the following decade and I started blogging and I wrote a ton on my blog. I mean, probably a couple million words over the span of a decade. I wrote for minor league baseball for a while and a little MLB.com stuff as well. Did a few YouTube videos, just not even planning to monetize it, not having career ambitions, but just, it's like, you know, I, I blog about the games I go to. Why not do a little video stuff? And the initial videos were short and they were bad. There was no storyline. It was really just kind of thrown together. And then the whole A-Rod thing happened in wow. 2015. And my entire life's work, everything I had ever done, you know, written three books, been on a lot of TV shows, kind of been in the public eye, not in a massive way, but, you know, I was known in the baseball world. All of that was dwarfed in the snap of a finger with that whole A-Rod thing. The amount of attention I got and the number of people that were suddenly aware of me, not all good. There was a lot of negative stuff that, that came out of that, but there was just suddenly so much attention for better or worse that when I happened to do a few videos after that, again, still not monetized, <laughs> those, videos, those videos just started doing really well. They got, yeah. you know, a few thousand, vi uh, a few thousand views overnight. And I was like, oh my God, this is, I'm going viral, baby. Yeah. And I still wasn't monetized. 
Yeah. Not even till the following year. And I had a friend tell me that I needed to monetize my channel. And I was just like, what? She was like, oh my God, I'm going to show you how to do it. And, you know, in 2016, that's when I monetized my channel, did a few more videos. <laughs> Thanks. And <laughs> those, I remember getting like 7,000 views in one day for a video Amazing. and just thinking like, this is crazy. And it was that year that I realized, you know, I think I'm just going to do this full time, kind of make an investment in myself, not really expecting to make a ton of money the first year or even necessarily the first two years. But if I can keep growing, then it'll be something that I really can do full time that will sustain itself. So that's where we've gotten to now a few years later. So I really, without that A-Rod ball, I don't know what I'd be doing with myself at this point. Life is so weird. Everything, you know, some people believe everything happens for a reason and that, but why that all went so crazy wasn't because of the ball you caught. It was because of the balls that you caught before that, that were just brought to the attention right. because of this additional baseball and, you know, give or take, it's an important ball. Um, but it was, you know, the people that go really viral and the people that have a career are the people that go viral for something crazy like that, but then have stuff to back it up. That's a good point. Like that's the big difference between people that do one dance and it gets 50 million views on the internet and, you know, Ariana Grande <laughs> or Justin Bieber. There like that's go. the difference between those two things. When you go to their channel and you're like, oh, this dude's been putting out the same stuff for a year and I'm just finding it now. And then people trickle down and that's the whole point of having a catalog so that when somebody watches one of your videos, they watch 10 and then you make... 10 times the amount. I'm sure you're there. You're, all your content is extremely family friendly as I already know. So that's, uh, that's when things go right. Yeah. And I mean, you've done an amazing job for yourself getting to where you are in your career. So Thank you, coming from you, that means a lot. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's fun, man. I, I've, w one of the things that I love the most about what you do is you picked what you enjoyed and then you turn that into a career. If everybody was doing that, this would be a much lighter planet. Like everybody, there would be no stress. Everybody would be happy. You know, it's just, you know, there are, are certain positions where that's not possible. And, you know, there, um, but I think there can be more and more and more of those people and people like yourself doing that can show that that is possible for whatever that person's passion may be. Maybe it's, you know, collecting or, eating a strawberry from every country in the world, like whatever their passion is. Yeah. I, and I've definitely met some real characters over the years. I've played competitive Scrabble. Really? Yes. And I've interned for the National Scrabble Association at three, <laughs> at three different national championships. And there is one of the top Scrabble players in the world. His thing is drinking a cup of coffee at every different Starbucks location. I don't, I don't know how many thousands Let's of locations <laughs> he's done it. I hope Starbucks is paying him. And I think that I don't really know what the deal is. You know, he's wanted to be sponsored. And I think Starbucks was sort of like, eh, we don't know how we feel about this guy. I mean, this is years ago. I don't really yeah. know how it ended up, but- I mean, if he's doing it anyways, why would Starbucks pay him? <laughs> yeah. And you know, people often suggest that MLB should put me on the payroll. And it's like, well, that would be cool. But you know, I'm, I'm doing this regardless. So why should they pay me? But I feel like- And they if, do support you. Well, they, they certainly don't stop me in any way. And, you know, I guess, yeah, they do support me in the sense that they put out that short documentary, what, maybe a year and a half ago, kind of uh, telling my whole story of getting to 10,000 baseballs. You know, if they didn't like what I was doing, they certainly would not promote me. For sure. And I've had an interesting relationship with MLB over the years, like for the last decade, I've, I've done some stuff with them on and off and they've always been great and I'd love to do more. So for right now, you know, if I am just doing it on my own, I'm cool with that. You know, I just, I have a lot of fun and I reach a lot of people and I'm still amazed that anybody even cares about some dude that runs around catching baseballs. But I also realize that it's a lot bigger than that. For sure. And it's, it's really cool to have struck that chord and found this niche angle in the sports world, which is becoming bigger and bigger, you know? hundred percent, man. I think that's a good way to end the video version of the podcast. So ladies and gentlemen watching this on YouTube, hop over to Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Apple Music, wherever you're listening to this podcast, wherever you'd like to listen to podcasts and listen to the five minute audio exclusive oh, we do on the podcast where we oh. throw some of the real heaters. So you guys got to make sure you're uh -oh. subscribed 
on both platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see you on the next one or on the audio version. See you in a second.